Hello, and welcome to Eastern Hills Church. We are so glad you're here with us. Whether you know nothing about the Bible, God, or the church, or whether you've been involved with the church and following the Lord for many years, it's about taking the journey together and helping each other out along the way. So come join us and give us the privilege of doing life with you. We have a number of ways to do just that. You can connect and share with us anytime using Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. Or you can check us out on our website, ehwc.org. You can also connect with us using the Church Center app on your tablet or smartphone, where you can check for upcoming events, small group studies, online giving, and so much more. We are so happy you're here with us and happy to celebrate the good news of Jesus with you. What do social acceptance, relational friendships, empathy for those less fortunate, and marital bliss all have in common? They are areas where we want to enjoy contentment. Another area in this list found in Hebrews chapter 13 has to do with how we handle money. It can be a resource or a snare. We will see how in this two-week mini-series called Cravings. Well, good morning, Eastern Hills Church. Can you stand with us for worship? Good morning. It's Caleb Dawson. Love it. Well, I'm excited to get into this service today. Um, something that God has been teaching me so much lately is he just keeps saying, hey, there's no pressure on you because there's no glory for you. There's no pressure on you because there's no glory for you. Isn't it so cool when we step back and say, God, this is all about you. I don't have to make anything happen. I just get to see you be the God of glory. I just get to praise and worship you for all that you're doing. So we're gonna sing with that heart today, that mindset that God, the God of glory, the God who can actually do immeasurably more, doesn't need anything from you this morning, but does wanna meet with you this morning. So we're gonna worship, we're gonna sing this song that there is joy in the house of the Lord. And no matter what you're facing, no matter what transition is happening in the world, God is still good. He's still able to do immeasurably more. He is still expecting us to come and bring our joy and our hope and our peace today. Amen? Let's worship that God. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, my God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace 
pay attention when God does stuff like that because maybe there's somebody in this room that needs those words today so if you wouldn't mind just turn your face toward heaven maybe reach out a hand we're going to sing that one more time I could sing of your love here we go I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever
That's why I just want to sing of your love forever, Father, because your goodness is always running after us. Your word says that we love you because you loved us first. So we're just acknowledging that together this morning. That's why we're here, because you loved us first. So sing all my life.
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love He is a firm foundation I will put my trust Father, this is, our, this is our vow, this is our prayer, that we will build our lives on your love. Lord, you are the rock, you are the firm foundation, you are the beginning and the end, and you are the base. You, with, everything begins with you, Lord. Our lives are an outpouring and an overflowing what it is that you set forth, whatever it is that you say we do, Father. I pray that you give us the strength to follow within your footsteps, Lord, to lean into your love, to lean into that foundation, and to truly build our lives on what it is that you say. Lord, I pray over the message that we hear this Sunday, Lord, I pray that your word speaks through Pastor Pat and that it reaches deep down deep into our hearts and stirs us to follow you more deeply, Father. I pray that you be with each and every single one of us and I pray, Lord, that we can just rest, that you have gone before and that we can just build our hearts on your love. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Well, it's good to be together, isn't it, church? I, I love the chance that we get to gather every single weekend. And this is our second week of kind of our new schedule. Uh, Saturday nights, we had our service last night. It was just a wonderful time of being together and uh, starting to build another uh, intimate community of people on Saturday nights, and it's, it's really neat. And then we get the chance today to be together for our one Sunday morning service. Like I said last week, um, you might be sitting in a different seat or trying to get into a different situation. So why don't you turn to the person next to you, maybe you've never met before. Just say hi, introduce yourself if you haven't met yet, and I want to tell you about a couple things. I know some of you were like, yes, I get to talk to people. Some of you were like, please don't make me talk to anybody. I just want to get in a little bubble and stay where I'm at. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing to get to know new people because this is part of what it means to be part of a church family. We're not just here 
together just to attend something or just to consume something. We're here to be part of a church family and to invest. We, as we've talked about this year, have about 60 different simple churches in this community that are really living life together. And then we get this chance, why we have started calling these, instead of services, gatherings, is because we get to gather together all of our simple churches on the weekends to be able to worship God and keep growing together. And so we're happy to have you be part of this today. And if you're new here today, we're just happy to have you here. We hope you go over to the Connection Center, get a little gift from us, and uh, get connected. We'd love to show you around a little bit as well. Um, We've been having a lot going on as always, but we want to tell you about something we might not have told you about, which is a biblical citizenship class that we've been having the past couple months. Um, You know, we believe that as Christians, we need to be, um, you know, a Christian in every sphere of our life. And this class has been a really neat group. I think 30 or 40 different people have been gathering together just to walk through the opportunity to learn a little bit about history and learn what it means. What does it mean to live biblically in the midst of a society, in the midst of a way that we could bless other people but do that in the midst of community and society? So that's been really neat. Um, That's going to go into the summer. We're actually going to have a group called Colson that we'll tell you more about next week that we've had here a couple years. But it's a similar vein in the sense of how do we develop a worldview by which we can continue to live rightly in the midst of the world. And so uh, it's just been really neat. If you meet somebody from one of those classes, ask them what it's been about, and, uh, and they'd love to tell you more about that. If you're new here again today, uh, we're so glad you're here. I'm Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we'd love to have you fill out a connection card. And that's not just for new people. That's for anybody that's here. It's a great way for us to stay connected. Whether you fill out a connection card in front of you, put it in the boxes on the way out, or if you want to check in online at Church Center app or go online, you can do that as well. There's a lot of different ways to give as well on a weekly basis. You can give online. You can uh, put it in the boxes on the way out. But last week we told you that you know over the past couple of weeks, some of these changes has been a deliberate way that we can make our community more of a community and also allow us to reach more people. And also just responding to things that we've heard. And one of those things that we've heard is, hey, it's easier if you pass the plates. Sometimes I forget to put my offering in. And so we're still going to have the boxes in the back on the way out if you're used to that. But we're actually going to invite the ushers forward now. And we're going to continue to uh, pass the plates as well. So it's an opportunity for you to give your tithes and offerings if that's you. If you're new here today, don't worry about it. Uh, But we'd love for our church community that we're together. If you have something to give to the Lord, um, they're going to be passing that now as we go through the rest of these announcements. Uh, just a couple things coming up. Tonight is our graduation celebration. Uh, any graduates out there? Uh, not are willing to say, say that they're graduates. I know we got some of the youth in here today. Uh, but tonight, uh, June 4th at 6.30, we're gonna, the group's going to be in the uh, front lawn. Uh, bring a lawn chair. Come and celebrate with our graduates. It's an important thing that we can get together, and it's such an amazing step for somebody to graduate from high school and be ready to go on. And so uh, if you're one of those families, join with them. Be there tonight, 6.30, the front parking lot. We'd love to celebrate with them. We have something big, uh, just a couple of handful of big things coming up this summer that we want to prioritize, and one of those is Mega Camp. It's our version of VBS. And so from July 18th to the 20th, from 6 to 8.30 on those nights, we're going to have Mega Camp, and it's a big thing, so many kids involved. It's a great way to reach new people for the gospel and to share the good news of Jesus and allow a space for kids to, to really uh, follow Jesus here, there, and everywhere, as it says up there. And so uh, Donna is really excited about this, and the team is really excited about this. But they need some people that are willing to to step in and just serve in the midst of that context. And so there's a table out there in the atrium. Uh, We just encourage you to go talk to them afterwards. Or you can sign up at ehwc.org slash serve. That's another way you can connect with that. Hey, if you've been here a while and uh, you're just looking to get engaged with the church more and figure out what it means to be a member. Now, for us, membership is not like a club membership. It's a way that you're just saying, I believe in the mission of Eastern Hills and the mission of the gospel, and I just want to be a part of that. And so if you want to hear more about that, next week, 11 a.m., right after services, lunch will be provided uh, in the living room. You can come. It's about an hour, hour and a half, and uh, we just want to walk you through what it means to be a member, talk a little bit more about the vision and the mission of the church. And so we invite you to be part of that. Because there is food provided, we just ask that you respond to us if you can, if you, if you know that you're coming. So if you can just send an email to Peggy um, or call the church and uh, connect with us, we would love to hear from you uh, that you're coming next week. One other thing happening next week is our tech open house. June 11th, next week at 11 a.m., right afterwards in the worship center. And so we'd love to have you come. If you're just interested in finding out more about what, there's so many different tools. In fact, we have a brand new soundboard in here today that we've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and we finally got the the, uh, pieces together that today we actually have a brand new soundboard that is back there, and Alan and the team have done such a great job installing it this week. Uh, Yeah. 
But I know some of you walk by some of those techie things and you're just like, I don't even want to look there. I have no idea what I'm doing, right? But there are some of you that when you see a gadget with all kinds of shiny buttons, you just want to start pressing stuff, right? And if that's you, uh, we would just love to continue to build the teams that we have around tech, which means sound. Back in the back, many of you have never seen that we have this uh, two different booths back there. We have a broadcast studio and we have a, a booth where there's all kinds of video equipment. We would love to just show you. You're not committing to serve on a weekly basis, but if you're interested, come next week at 11 a.m. and we'd love to have you check it out and uh, find out a little bit more and maybe press some really shiny buttons. So it'll be fun. So. Well, today is, uh, you know, we, I have been here now for close to 15 years, and for all that time, we have faithfully served next to Sean and Danielle King and have loved the time that we've gotten to spend with them. I detailed in a little thing I wrote to them just the many different trips we went on and the people we've ministered to, and it's been an honor, and we just want to make sure that we can send them off in the right way. We can pray over them and send them off, so we're going to invite Sean and Danielle to come forward and uh, Pastor Pat's gonna come out, and we would just love to give them the opportunity to, to share a little bit and uh, receive some things and receive love from us. So, yeah. so I asked Sean last night, they, they came to the Saturday evening service as well. I just had them to share a little bit about um, what lies before them and share anything they'd like to with the church family uh, before we give them some gifts and just pray over them. So Sean, as the family comes to join you, we're so grateful for all of you. Why don't you tell them a little bit about what you're going to be doing? Yeah, so Revive uh, Wesley and I've had friends over there for um, years, and uh, they uh, contacted us recently and just said, hey, would you be interested in a position here? And my first answer was, no, I'm good. Um, but as, as we prayed about it, as we talked about it, God kind of made it clear that this was the next step for our family. So it's, it's bit bittersweet. We're really excited about um, where we're going, but... Uh, we're definitely going to miss all of you guys, and uh, so I'll be leading worship at our Eden campus there uh, on Sundays, and then uh, during the week just helping out with all kinds of production stuff. But um, something that's been really big for us is just honoring where we've come from, honoring where we've been. So here, I'll hand you the mic, and I'll take the things. All right, I get to do the fun part. We were thinking about our journey here, and first of all, just wanted to say, we built our whole family here. When I came here, um, I didn't even know Sean. I met him here as a friend, we dated, we got married, and we raised our children here, and um, we did that alongside of all of you. So you've helped us give a beautiful foundation for our family, and we're so grateful for that forever. Um, and we were thinking about parts of our journey, and these are the things that came to mind. So. When we got married, Pastor Pat married us, and he gave us a gift of a word, and the word was light. And um, we remembered that all throughout our marriage, and I was thinking about how more than the gift of thinking about light in marriage, but you and your family, you two, have really taught us the value of honoring and um, loving the word, and the word is the light and the lamp to our feet and our path, and we want to thank you and honor you for that, because that was huge for both of our spiritual journeys. Um, you guys and Sean have bonded immensely over, <laughs> over coffee. All the time I see Pastor Pat coming down to use the coffee maker in Sean's office. <laughs> and it says, welcome to our coffee sip and Jesus loving home sweet home. And we just thought of you and Pam when we saw that. <laughs> and, and lastly, you did a sermon just a couple weeks ago where you said you didn't know what this particular tool was. And we thought maybe you should have one. <laughs> so go ahead and give that to us. And Sean had to teach you and tell you what it was called. I don't even remember what it's called, but now you can know and have one. <laughs> it's a speed square, speed square. But this is a special one because it, like, pops out and goes further, so it's really cool. But we just wanted to say thank you so much to, to our church. Thank you for all that you guys are. Um, just honored to have been here. So appropriate. After 18 years almost, right, of being here and serving, and you guys, uh, I remember those early days when you guys first got together and everything, and watching these guys grow up has been such a blessing to us. Uh, I feel like we adopted an extra family into our family, and so we're grateful for that. Well, we want to send you off with some gifts, and you knew that they were coming, but um, anyway, 
You know, for any of you that know Sean, one of his other passions uh, of the many, I, I've told him before, it must be miserable being you because you're so gifted in so many things. Um, but some of us only have one or two things, so, you know. But uh, with him, his woodworking is something that's really passion, a passion for his. So um, we, we got a picture of Jesus doing carpentry. And I think it's appropriate as you take this along and remember that you've got a family that's always watching how the Lord is using you. And so we'll give that to you, and you can keep it now. So that, that's the great thing about this. And, Daniel, one of the things that we are so grateful for is here, especially in this last year or two, you have been on the forefront with Janelle and some others in establishing our homeschoolers group here. And uh, it's fun every Tuesday to watch the kids come together, the sprouts, and, and to see what you're investing in them. And, and so we got you, uh, this is called 101 More Devotions for Homeschool Moms. And so as you continue to do that with the kids, thank you so much. We love you guys so very much. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike to join us, too. Uh, where he is, there he is, and as an executive team, we just want to pray over you as we go, and then we're going to do a race with Goldie, it looks like, right? <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. Why don't you guys use that mic and just wonder, you guys pray, and then I'll pray to close over uh, them. Well, um, Father, we just come to you today, and we are just so grateful and thankful for the ministry of Sean and Danielle and for their kids we're so grateful that we've had the chance to walk next to them, to be blessed by them, um, just as people. Uh, the many countless conversations, the many countless um, stories that have been told uh, by many people about how their lives have impacted so many other people in this church, and that this truly has been their family. We truly are their family, that we have walked with them, they've walked with us, and uh, we couldn't be more thankful for that. It's hard to detail everything uh, that has really transpired over the years, but we know that you are faithful and that we know you're a faithful God no matter what the journey is. And part of being a family sometimes is sending people off uh, to, from the family uh, to report back and hear what, what God's doing, but to know that you're walking with them. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And so we just pray a blessing over them today. We pray that in the same way that you have uh, blessed them, but also made them a blessing here, that you would do the same thing at their next church family. We pray that you'd uh, lead and direct them every step of the way. We thank you so much for these kiddos and for how you have just grown them here and Sean and Danielle's great investment in them. And we pray for their future as well and the callings that you're going to put on their lives. And we pray that you would uh, just, again, direct them every step of the way um, so that and we can hear the reports along the journey to know what it is you're up to and be blessed as well, uh, that we got to be part of their story, they got to be part of ours, and now they're taking, sending off in a different adventure, um, but we also get to serve the same God, and we're so thankful for that, Lord. Lord, your book tells us that you will honor those who honor you. And Sean, Danielle, and this family have certainly done that. And accordingly, you're honoring them, Father. It has been such a blessing. I don't know how we're going to get by without Sean and the family, Father, being up in the room and just all that love and the action and the life that they've lived. Father, I ask that you bless them as they go on a new adventure and they bless so many more. I thank you as the children grow up, Father, would you let them grow strong and straight. And Father, let them be a blessing to the community that they'll now be serving. I ask, Father, for all that you have, all the grace that you can give them, that you give them, Father. Because I know they'll be doing the same back to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we thank you for all the years that these two have put into the ministry of the church here. But more importantly, the relationships, the life that we've gotten to share uh, as we watched Phoebe and Riley and, and Goldie grow up, Father, and, and just uh, enjoy their energy, their laughter, their questions, their observations. They have been just such a blessing, Father. And it flows from hearts of parents that just want to honor you in all things. And, and that's what times like this are all about, because our assignments are under your control. You are the head of the church. And so, Father, we just pray blessing and grace and honor to follow them as they go to this new assignment. I, I, I pray, Father, that just as we will feel their absence, we know that you also are preparing a way for them as they establish relationships in the new church family that they'll be a part of. 
But while they go out from us, they will never be apart from us because they will always be a part of us. Uh, That's what life in you is all about. And so we're grateful for them, and we just send them off uh, to continue their pursuit of honoring you and loving people wherever they go. May your blessing rest upon them, Father. And we look forward to hearing all the ways that you're using them for your glory in the days ahead. We send them off in the matchless name and power and authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Love you. So very much. Hey, buddy. Love you. Love you. Love you, dear. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, honey. Hey, you. Come here. Yeah, love you. Hebrews 13, take your Bible and turn there if you would. Isn't it good to celebrate? I like celebrations. I know some of you felt like it's, um, uh, what somebody call it, Maycember, something like that. It just seems like there's a lot going on uh, lately with all the school celebrations and everything too, and that's a way we can celebrate. If you're fairly new to the church, and even if you're not, it's easy to forget. Two years ago, we, as a senior team, were together on retreat, and we felt that the Lord gave us a vision for five years. That five-year vision is stated somewhat like this. Our prayer is for God to unleash a spirit-empowered movement through kingdom multiplication while we experience the fullness of Jesus Christ in holy moments. That's a lot of words that basically breaks down to this, that we're asking God to unleash something that goes far beyond us, and we identified five areas where we asked the Lord to unleash something. The first was resources, talking about money and people and the use of our building and and everything else. Uh, The second one talked about leadership, for the Lord to help us put in perspective how we're to impact our culture. And, And so we should establish leadership in our culture, uh, each one of us individually. Begins in, in us individually and then in our homes and then in our communities. The third one is where we are this year as, as we talk about disciple making and how do we intentionally have conversations with people about spiritual truth and about the gospel. Uh, we're focused on that this year. Next year is going to be on opportunities and I found it fascinating this week. I had a guy contact me and, and we're not in a position to do this right now, but he said, I just bought a church on, on Thompson Road, but I realize I'm not going to be able to use it, and it's a turnkey. It's ready to go. Would you be interested in buying a church on Thompson Road? And you could maybe use it as an extension campus. And I thought, that's a great idea, but we're not going to do that right now, but maybe somebody will. But I thought, a new opportunity. God's already previewing to me that he has some fresh opportunities for us individually or us corporately to take advantage of to see the gospel spread all around the world. And then finally, holy moments. Because when God is moving, there are holy moments that take place that we can't even imagine that they would take place, where God provides something unexpectedly or heals some way unexpectedly or does something unexpected. So we've been praying on this vision. The first one had to do with resources, though, and I want to take us back there today because as a theme for this vision, here's what we gave, uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Now, when we talked about resources, one of the things that we've carried for a long time, in December of 2009, our debt, uh, including our construction loans and our our mortgage and some other debt that we had, totaled over $8 million, and, and that was weighing us down. By the spring of 2010, uh, we had, uh, that was the fall of 20, uh, 2009. By February 2010, we sold the Burdick campus, and that brought our debt down to $6 million. And, and we've continued to pay on that. Um, but we felt in this vision that God was saying, it's time, let's unload that debt. And so we began what we called the Immeasurably More Financial Freedom Campaign. And we laid out, at that point, our, our total debt was $3.168 million. And, and we said, okay, God, give us a plan. 
Now, that plan includes we're selling some property back behind us, eight acres, and by God's grace, that should be completed in at least the next two months, and we'll be getting $600,000 for that property. Uh, In addition, we set out a campaign, and we figured between what our payments were and the sale of that property, we were going to need to raise an additional $1.042 million in order to get rid of our debt by May 31st of 2024, so a year from now to be debt-free. I wanted to show you where we are at this point in time. We have a slide to show you, and that's what our M represents. Every one of those lines represents a six or a $50,000 uh, giving. The commitments that we got towards that goal were $752,000. But notice to date, with a year to go, we're at seven hundred twelve. dollars There's plenty of people that didn't make a commitment but that have been giving. I believe, by God's grace, and, and we've got a ways to go and everything, but I still believe that by God's grace and by his provision, a year from now, we're going to be debt-free. And in doing that, I want to tell you what that means. Right now, one weekly offering goes to debt reduction. One weekly offering. Just imagine what it would be to be free from that. So we are believing God for that. Now, as I look through what takes place in regard to the whole idea of resources, I realize, too, that there's about 10% of our congregation or more that never heard about this before because they, you haven't been here. And so I didn't want you to miss a blessing because, you see, I could tell, I could stand here for the next uh, 20 minutes or more and tell stories about people who said, you know what, I made that commitment and I didn't realize what God was going to do. And suddenly I got this in and I prayed that as he provides, I give. And as we do that, we have stories over and over and over again where people have found that God is faithful, that if you honor him, he will honor you, and he will provide for you to be generous. It's God's view of resources. In fact, throughout my life, I have found that as I take a perspective, God's perspective about resources that, that he surprises me over and over and over again. And one of the number one anxieties that people have are, I don't know how to deal with my debt. I don't know how to deal with how I'm going to pay for this and this and this and this. And resources, money, can be a source of challenges for us. And so I ask myself this question. What interrupts my peace about resources, what what can overshadow to the point where I slide into the whole issue of anxiety about money? Why is it that I don't feel free about the idea of money? Why do I get so frustrated? Why is it that I have, uh, you know, either depression over it or I have resentment over it that God isn't providing enough for me? And the number one thing I came up with is cravings. Cravings. And I want to talk for the next few minutes about the issue of cravings. I came across this quote from that well-known theologian, Kelly Clarkson. (laughs) And here's what she said. I love healthy stuff and junk an equal amount. Whatever I'm craving, I go for it. I'm never trying to lose weight or gain it. I'm just being. And I thought, what an interesting perspective. I love good stuff and I love bad stuff. I don't know about you, but I find the bad stuff leads me down a different path. And she says, I'm not trying to gain weight or lose it. I don't care. I just am being and following my cravings. What do cravings do for us? Because not all cravings are bad. But when cravings apply to resources, to money, um, you may be aware of this man, John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller, at one point in the early part of of the 1900s, his wealth equaled 1% of all the money in the United States. One person, 1% of everything. And he was asked this question, so how much is enough money? And he said, does anybody know? Just a little bit more. It doesn't matter how much you have. He says, what's enough? Just a little bit bit more. It sounds to me his perspective was interesting, isn't it? Because we all feel like we could use just a little bit more. That's what cravings do. 
Let me give you a couple of observations about cravings. We'll just do these real quick. It's a part of the human condition. Cravings itself are not bad. Lately in these temperatures, 90 degrees or whatever, I've been craving a lot of water. Why? Because my body's getting depleted. That craving's not a bad craving, it's a good craving. I'm glad, I, I've been drinking a lot more water because I don't wanna get dehydrated. So cravings themselves are not bad. It's just a matter of what we're doing with those cravings and where those cravings will take us. They are motivations toward fulfillment. That's the second thing. They're a motivation to say, okay, I have this thing in my heart. I have this craving within my body. I have this craving within my mind. What do I do about that? They are motivations to try to see their fulfillment. Here's an interesting thought. They can be filled without being satisfied. They can be filled without being satisfied. You crave sugar, you get a Paula's donut, how many of you, after having a Paula's donut, have fulfilled the craving for sugar, but you're not satisfied? Uh-huh, didn't hear many amens, but I hear a lot, uh-huh, yeah. Because you get your sugar fix, but it's not lasting. It doesn't fulfill. It's called empty calories. There's frequently that Pam will say to me, I'm not gonna waste my calories on that. And she is so smart. And she's right. I waste some of my calories on that. And I don't find satisfaction. Fourth, it can lead to destruction or contentment. Cravings can lead to destruction. A drug addict shoots a line. It leads to destruction. There's a craving in their body that gets fulfilled momentarily. But it doesn't lead anywhere good. But a person is generous towards somebody in need, and they find that a longing gets fulfilled, contentment. And that's the word I want to focus on for just the next few minutes with you, because it's a word that I find its meaning to be very interesting. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those that want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, please note that, the love of money is a root of all kind of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You notice that money itself isn't bad. It's amoral. But the love of money, putting money front and center in your pursuits about life, ignoring God and just saying it's all about getting a little bit more. When we do that, it can bring ruin. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I find it interesting that that concept is mentioned right here in Hebrews chapter 13 amidst some other cravings. Please note with me. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. A marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. What can men do to me? It's interesting to me that there seems to be a hodgepodge of things here. Let me just lay them out for you as far as cravings are concerned. Verse 1 talks about relational cravings. We all have a need to be loved and to love. And in that craving within us, that gets fulfilled when we continue to love each other as brothers and sisters. We demonstrated some of that this morning as we love on the kings. There's a social craving that happens. Verse 2, don't forget to entertain strangers. It was a common practice in Eastern culture then, and it is today, to make sure to practice hospitality, be gracious to people that are there 
and, and, and need cared for. There is a social craving that we have. And, and he's saying, do you understand that you may be experiencing the immeasurably more of God because sometimes when you've entertained a stranger, that may have been an angel that God sent there for some reason. Do you ever leave an encounter and think, I wonder if that was an angel? Have you ever experienced that? I have had several times in our lives where that has taken place. So there's a social craving. There's an empathy craving. Verse 3 Consider those in prison and those that are suffering as if you were the prisoner and as if you were suffering. So think about that. There is an empathy. There is a great empathy in this land, and I'm grateful for it, because when catastrophes happen around the world, the number one nation that sends money and supplies to try to help with those needs is the United States of America. I'm grateful for the empathy that takes place. And somebody is, is suffering, one of your friends, you feel their pain. That's a craving that we have. We, we want to know that if I were in the same circumstance, somebody else would be concerned about me. The fourth area of cravings that's mentioned here is marital and sexual cravings. Marital and sexual cravings. Marriage should be held in honor among all people. And the marriage bed kept pure. Each of these, we could do sermon upon sermon about them, but he's saying in the context of cravings, that is fulfilled in that relationship. It doesn't mean you have to be married in order to have relational kinds of, of, of things fulfilled, but it does say we should hold marriage up as a high institution because there's a craving and there's a foundational block for the building of any culture that's based on the home. And sexual craving should be kept within the context of marriage. And in the midst of all these cravings, suddenly he comes up with this one, and I think, how does that fit into all of this? Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, neither will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. Keep your heart, your mind, the word literally means the turns of your life, the verbiage of your life, the thinking of your life, your character. Keep your character free from the love of money. Now why? Why should we do that? Because again, I don't want us to miss the immeasurably more that God has for us. I, I don't want us to live with anxiety. I, I don't want to see us falter and honoring God with absolutely everything to understand that we brought, how much do you bring into this world? Nothing. How much are you gonna take out? I never saw a U-Haul <laughs> behind the hearse, right? We didn't bring anything in and we're not taking anything out. All the material stuff, I had a good friend that we just received word this morning, good friend that's battling stage four bladder, or, uh, gallbladder cancer. A battery exploded in his garage this week. They're, both their family vehicles, their garage, and because of smoke damage, their house has been made unlivable for the next six months. You say, wow, you feel for that. But stuff can go just like that. If you ever had a house fire or anything, what's the number one thing people say to me? That's just stuff. I'm glad the family's okay. So it puts it in perspective for us, and I want to give you just three things that will help us talk about contentment. I, I want to zero in on that word and, and give you some perspective about it. The first thing about contentment, though, that I want you to see is this. I'm going to define the word in just a moment because it helped me so much when I saw this. Financial cravings, the love of money, it, it's a spiritual issue. It's not a supply issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not a supply issue. Keep your heart, your lives, your character free from the love of money and be content with what you have. It's a spiritual issue. The implication is to keep our lives free from avarice, from greed, from making money an idol. Keep your heart free from that. And I, I remember back in the days when Pam and I had we didn't even have two pennies. People talk about quarters and dimes. We were down at pennies. 
When we would have a date, we would get Dunkin' Donuts, we would get two coffees and one donut to split because that's all we could get. And here's what I found. If we had, I, I think our first, our first pay was like $11,000. That's annually. I'm not talking monthly. I'm talking annual. And wherever you are on a scale, if you were down where we were or, or you go and you increase, here's what I found. If you don't find a way to honor God with what you have at $11,000, if you have $111,000, you still won't honor God with it. And you will still act like you don't have enough because Rockefeller said you only need how much? Just a little bit more. So if you do not understand how to deal with that when you are here, you won't understand how to deal with it if you have this much. It's not a matter of the supply, it's a spiritual issue. That's the first thing we need to see about this. And I have personally discovered that when we have very little, I had to ask myself some questions. Because we always think if we had more, I'd be better off. But am I trusting God for my needs now? If I have a lot of money, am I still trusting God for my needs? Or do I say, who needs God? See, if you got a bunch of money floating around, sometimes you don't need God because you're fine. We need to ask those questions. Am I honoring God with what I have now? Am I living within my means now? Do I crave more because my brother or my neighbor or my friends have more? Or do I resent that they have more and I don't? It's a good question. You see, financial cravings are a spiritual issue. They're not a supply issue. Second thing. We keep this craving in check through barriers. And here's where we get to the definition of contentment. Keep your heart free, your life free, your character free from the love of money, and be content. What's it mean to be content? How would you define contentment? A lot of people think it just means to be satisfied with what you have, but that's not what this word means. I want you to picture sitting down this afternoon and you order something on Amazon. No, you just check something out on Amazon. Within two seconds, what's gonna happen? Your email comes up and you have an advertisement of what you look for. Your social media pops up and somehow you have a memory about something you never bought yet but somehow they put it in there. You know what I mean? It gets ridiculous after a while. You don't want to look for anything because they got algorithms that are going to throw it everywhere. And what are they doing? They are going ahead and they're appealing to your cravings. Because you look for this, we're going to help you get there. And over and over and over again, cravings come at us like a flood. When I was in college, Fort Wayne, Indiana was 25 miles away. Fort Wayne has three rivers that come together, and when I was in college, there was a massive storm that came up through and dumped water on us for almost a week, and the rivers were flooding, and when you have three of them coming together, that town is going to get inundated, and so they called on every college in the region, and there's a ton of us, please come and fill sandbags and build walls so that we can contain the flood. And so we went and we spent hours filling bags and piling them up to try to keep the flood out. Do you know what the word contentment means? I love this. The word contentment means to put a barrier up. It is a means by which you come and you say, I'm not going to allow the flood of temptation to continue to entice me to go get my Paula's Donut or to buy that thing, because I don't need that. I may crave it, but I don't need it. And the barrier does two things. It gives you the opportunity to keep something out, but it also allows you to enjoy something that you have on this side of the barrier. The same word is used by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. If you know this account, he had some issue in his life that was, he called it the thorn of his flesh. And at that point, whatever it was that he had, many think it was an eye problem, as God responded to his three times that he asked for it to be taken away, here's what God says. My grace is sufficient 
My grace is contentment, same word. My grace is the barrier for you, Paul, that you don't need that taken away because I'm going to give you what you need on the inside of the barrier so that you can withstand dealing with that issue. My grace is sufficient. And so wherever we are, contentment is saying, and, and Paul himself states at one point in Philippians, he says, look, I know what it is to have everything I need plus And I know what it is to have absolutely nothing, but I've learned the lesson of being content, being satisfied with where I'm at because those cravings are kept in check by the grace of God. There is an interesting thing that happens to where I find contentment and and my yes towards God and recognizing him is, is because I can say no to this. So the bigger yes helps me with my no. When Justin was in high school, he, um, he turned 16, wanted to get a car. He had saved up money, and we went to a tent sale in the Kmart parking lot. And I remember going in, and I looked over, and here's a Z28, and I thought, that's a fine-looking ride. And I looked over here, and there's a souped-up muscle car, and I thought, that, that looks nice, too. Oh, I'm getting nervous because I remember being 16 and thinking that'd be kind of cool. And my brother had a Super B, and that would go from zero to 50, and, you know. And Justin starts looking around the lot, and you know what he ended up with? A very stripped-down Ford Escort. You wound windows up and down. It had power nothing. Um, And do you know what? We went to, to buy that, and he talked to the guy, and they started processing. And the guy looked at us and said, where do you get one of them? I said, one of what? One of, a kid like that. <laughs> Every 16-year-old I have coming in here is going after this and this and this. And I said, well, he has some bigger goals. And he knows his need is for transportation. His need is not to try to impress somebody and spend a lot on, on premium leaded gas to try to burn rubber on the streets. His bigger yes and vision and goal was greater. And isn't that what Jesus said? Look at the flowers of the field. They look pretty good out there, don't they? Hey, look at the birds. They're not toiling for anything. But Solomon in all his splendor doesn't look like those flowers. And those birds don't live with anxiety. Because their father cares for them. And that's exactly what we have here. You see, you put those things in check by putting the barriers up. And that really leads us to the third thing. And that is the sufficiency is based on God's provision. Because, he says. Because. It's a big word. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said... Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Sufficiency is based on your father knows what you need before you ever express it to him. So you need not worry about any of this. Godliness with contentment is great gain because our father will provide what we need. Now many of us get ourselves in trouble because we violate something. I, I find this interesting. Can anybody quote Proverbs 22, 6 for me? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Why in the world would God put as the very next verse, the rich roll over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender? Parents, grandparents, Think about your kids. Train up a child in the way they should go. Teach them that not every craving that comes into their heart should be fulfilled with a credit card. Teach them that resources are God's gift to us to manage, not something that we have to keep getting a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more so we can buy a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and become enslaved to somebody, and all of us knows what it is to be enslaved to something. And so he just says, look, 
Sufficiency is based on God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Well, the questions that I want to give you for some reflection, and then next week we're going to talk practically about how do we deal with this then? How, how do we view resources from God's perspective? And I, I can't wait to share it with you because, again, I'm talking about us all experiencing immeasurably more freedom from that pursuit, but also amazing ways that God gives generously because he loves to give generously to those that are honoring him with his resources. Let me give you a couple questions for reflection. Does my life reflect contentment or resentment because God's not giving me enough or dissatisfaction just because I don't know how to think about this? Second question, how does the spirit of godliness play into my view of resources? Do I even think about pursuing God and his direction for my life? Or don't I even think about that, especially if I have enough resources to make it? And are the resources that I have control over mine or God's? There's a great question. Is it mine or God's? I'll give you this final thought, and then I'm going to ask the ushers to get prepared to, to uh, serve us communion in just a moment. Andy's going to come out and play for us. But I find this interesting this morning. I was in Psalm 73. And at the beginning of this psalm, which I love the end of this psalm, and I'll tell you about the end of the psalm at another time, but at the beginning of this psalm, Asaph is writing, and he's got a real issue because he looks around, and, and he's wrestling with this very issue. He, he says, I, I look around, and I see the arrogant, and I see the proud, and I see evil people, and they seem to be prospering, and they just keep building their wealth. And, and again, money is amoral, being wealthy is not a sin. But he said they just keep going, and with their mouth, they just speak against God. And they say, well, whew, what God is there? What can he do to us? What's he even taking notice of it? And he said, at that point, I'm just feeling it, and I don't understand it. And, and I, I, I couldn't speak that way. In fact, if I spoke that way, I know that that I would be speaking against your children and everything that you represent, God. But I am feeling that I've kept myself pure in vain. I've served you because I struggle and they got all that they need. And he is really all stirred up inside about this. And he says, my thinking just took me to a place that was dark until I got to the house of the Lord. And when I come in amongst God's people, I start getting my stinking thinking taken care of and I get a perspective because the eternal destiny of those folks is not what they think they're getting. Their eternal destiny is dark. But my eternal destiny is bright. A perspective. And all I want us all to enjoy is perspective about all of this in life because heaven and earth is going to pass away. But God and his word and those that follow him will never pass away. We can enjoy the blessings of God eternally. i got another question for you. When Jesus was on earth, was he rich or was he poor? Ah, we say that. Let me think. The son of man, foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the son of man, What? has no place to lay his head. Doesn't sound like he's very rich. He wasn't living in a Hilton. It's interesting because here's what Paul writes at one point. In the context of talking to the Corinthians because they were being generous in helping out some brothers and sisters that were in need, he said, I'm not commanding you about any of this, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Because there's some other people that were giving out of their poverty and they were being very generous. Here's what he said. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet he came here and for our sake he became poor so that through his poverty we could be rich. Do you consider yourself rich today? That's a relative term, isn't it? 
compared to the rest of the world, financially, we're all rich. But from a spiritual standpoint, he became poor so that we might become rich. We want to remember how he gave of himself wholeheartedly so that we could enjoy life together. If the ushers would come, they're going to serve you communion. I'm going to ask, and if you're new to our church, the way we do communion here, we have little cups. There's two of them there, so make sure you take two. There's a little wafer in the bottom, and then there's a juice on top. And if you desire gluten-free wafers, if you will raise your hand high, ushers will bring that to you so that you can have gluten-free. And we just want to spend the next couple minutes, how content are we? Are we trusting God or not? I want you to think about that while you receive these, and then I'll lead us in taking communion together. Just think about all the ways that God has been so good to you. And one of the things when I get life out, I start getting stinking thinking like Asaph did. I just sit down and I start thinking, okay, instead of thinking about these things, let's think about how God has been good. And I just start making a list. You know, you don't go too far till you realize, what in the world am I feeling down about? God is good. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. I have found, when we've had the privilege of going around the world, I have been in the presence of people that are extremely wealthy. And I've been in the presence of people that are living literally dirt poor. They have no floor in their home. And I have found that there can be joy in both places and there can be ugliness and depression in both places. But I found that people that don't live with anxiety over resources are some of the happiest people I know because they've learned to be content. Content. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Please note that. It's not just that it was broken, but it was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this little wafer. It reminds us of how you left the glories of heaven with all heaven and earth lauding you, praising you, worshiping you. And you came and you took on human form. And you came, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. You suffered hunger, some sleepless nights, cold and heat like we suffer. You know what it is to be rejected, to have your closest friends betray you. You know all the human condition, and yet you were without sin. You took on extreme poverty and didn't even have a place to lay your head, and yet you were filled with joy because you knew your Father would never leave you nor forsake you, and we rejoice in that today as well. And so thank you 
forgiving yourself in poverty so that we might enjoy the richness of the kingdom of God poured out in our lives. We thank you for that and celebrate it as we take and eat together. And then that last evening, Lord, you told your disciples, and this was amazing to me, he told the disciples, you've seen me do great things. Even greater things are you going to do. You'll see even greater things take place. He took a cup after the meal and he said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. My life is going to pour into you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this cup. We thank you that life is ours today. We've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Yet it's not us, but it's Christ living in us. The Father and the Son and the Spirit live in us. And because of that, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. Every resource, every relationship, all of it is available to us. All that belongs to the Father it belongs to the Son. And we are considered his brother and sister. So I pray today that as we take this and drink together, that we will experience contentment in a level that we never have yet. Again, we celebrate as we take and drink together. Amen and amen. one of the first songs that I wrote at Eastern Hills. And it was written at a time that I wasn't really sure what God was saying. And you might be in that same boat today where you're not sure what God is calling you to. Maybe there's anxiety in your heart about what he was speaking this morning. Maybe there's also this stirring that says, I just can't stay here anymore. So let's just offer our praise to him. Let's offer this cry to him that that we're going to step into what he has for us. We're going to leave the cravings behind and and pursue the God that fulfills. So if you want to respond in any way this morning and you're like, man, I just, I want to step into what God has for me, just stand during this song. Just lift your hands to him. He sees you. He knows your heart. He's calling you.
Trusting the Lord, that's what contentment really is all about. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the practical stuff of that. A couple things as you go. First of all, I failed to mention this earlier, but starting next week, as many of you know, we had prayer meeting on Saturday night, getting ready for Sundays, and as we shifted to the service, we're not getting as much prayer in there as what we had hoped. So starting next week at 5 o'clock every week, I'm going to be here to pray, and if you want to come join me, we're going to have prayer service prayer meeting before service from 5 to 545, and then we'll go into the evening service. So we'd like you to join us if you'd like to do that. Secondly, don't forget about membership class. Next weekend, uh, 11 o'clock, uh, we'll be here and, and would love to have you join us. If you have any questions about the church, you, you can go through the class, find out more, and, and, and hold off on your membership if you want to, but we'd love to have you there. And lastly, don't forget our kids tonight will be meeting at 630 out in front to honor our graduates. That'll be great. Final thing, and I talked about empty calories, but I give you blessing to go enjoy some because we have some cake and we want to celebrate the kings. So if you'd like to join in the living room, they're going to be over there. If you want to share some personal thanks to them for their ministry among us, you can join us in the living room right now. And There's cake available, plenty of cake to join in on that. God bless you as you go.
Can't say that I trust you alone, and I go. 